I have been making, uh, actually this is unfortunately my fifth decade of uh, filmmaking uh, and teaching. Uh, I started uh, obviously a very long time ago. Um, a few years ago I had to tally up uh, the number of projects that I produced or made for um, television and it's somewhere in the order of about 250 uh, over that time span. Um, <laughs> I'm so old, I started in film before there was any video whatsoever except in the studio. And now I'm presenting with, with Kylo's uh, smartphone filmmaking. So I've embraced all technologies. I was actually uh, the first person, if anybody remembers mini DV tape, remember that? I was the first producer to create a um, nationally broadcast television series with that equipment. Our Panasonic. Uh, decks were 00002 and 00003. And we almost didn't go into production on Going Places with Al Roker for PBS um, because uh, the equipment was embargoed in Los Angeles during the Reagan shutdown. Uh, so it was, uh, it was kind of an interesting time. So I'm, I'm, I like to be as innovative as I can and apply um, my, my thinking in the classroom to my professional practice. Um, while everyone's talking about high def and super high def and in our realm 2K, 4K, 6K, you know, big, big stuff, bigger is better. Um, a while back, um, I had a, a student in one of my production classes and he was interested in doing a self-portrait of his attempt to try to quit smoking. And our policy was he couldn't have the camera. Our cameras. Uh, from the equipment room long enough to really document. So I said, he had a flip phone, a Motorola or something. I said, use your phone. He said, you're crazy. But he did, and he embraced it and really made an award-winning uh, short little film. Now, our goal today is not to um, teach you how to create media, but to encourage you with your students to use what's available in your purse, in your backpack, in your pocket, to either self-document research, um, uh, do the classic um, uh, confessional camera, uh, or um, in in the field when you're when you allow students, I mean in the classroom when you allow students to bring uh, media as a component of their coursework to you, what can you help them do? to be successful in their efforts. So we thought that it would be a good idea to start with uh, the, the PowerPoint on how to make a, let's start with the sure. PowerPoint, on how to, um, how to tell a story visually with just some guides. And feel free to use this uh, PDF that I sent you in the classroom. And if you have any questions, any follow-ups, or you want me or, uh, offer Kyle to you, um, get in touch with us and we'll sit down uh, with you, with your students and, you know, troubleshoot, help, encourage, because this digital domain we live in is really critical. But, but uh, before we start, let's get Kyle yes, to I should introduce explain who, who I am. Um, I'm Kyle Brannon, or Kylos Brannon, that's a nickname, professor here uh, in SOC along with uh, Professor Engel. Um, I, uh, my background is professionally mostly in museums. Uh, I did a lot of uh, exhibit work before I became a full-time teacher. I've done a lot of independent filmmaking and sort of progressive media or emerging media or whatever buzzword we want to use at the moment. Uh, produced a web series here uh, with NBC that Larry actually shot. Oh, right. And uh, we won some awards. That was for. fun. Awesome. Uh, and I, I love working with th these devices, actually. I really like the portability of it. and. And it's only improving. Everything's always improving. You know, the, the things you can attach to it, the other devices you can take advantage of. And while it may never be the highest end thing, it's a. Uh, I knew I should. <laughs> it's always like it's not going to get worse. It's just getting better. And I'm watching these things get better. So I was very excited when Larry asked if I would participate today. I also, and I have a short video I brought. Um, I'm a VJ, so I do live video projection at clubs with DJs or with bands, 
or the occasional theater piece. I only get to do that twice. But it's really cool. Um, but I actually VJ'd a sold out show at the 9:30 Club last weekend, and I used this exact device to get some documentation. There's limitations in that because the lighting is a tough situation. But I have that too, so I not only make things, you know, for narrative or doc, but also just like here's what I'm doing tonight. Put it on Facebook. Um, so uh, yeah. I'll speak a little bit more about the kind of projects I have students do with this and what I've used, uh, we'll say, in and out of the classroom with them, too. Yeah, and I think that, so what we're going to do is uh, spend about 40, 45 minutes um, presenting a lot of stuff to you guys, talking about story, then talking about the equipment and the basic um, trouble spots in smartphone work or even iPad or tablet, uh, photography, and uh, filmmaking. So we'll deal with both image and sound, which is critically important, uh, but overall basic structure. Um, one of the things that I've always noticed among um, students, and of course our students want to be filmmakers, some come to us at the graduate level with experience, some at the undergraduate level with high school, uh, rather robust and in fact more experience than we get at the graduate level. Um, but what's always fascinating to me is that when we watch a film, it looks easy because the watching generally, except when it's a really bad film, the watching is easy. So it looks seamless. It feels right. It, you know, but, and nobody really understands just how long and difficult it is to actually create a scene, to create a sequence, to create something that um, has some aesthetic uh, intention that's executed well. So um, for almost everybody that I talk to, I have these things to think about. Um, and this has to do more probably with documentary than with fiction. Um, but it is applicable to fiction in the sense of uh, recreations, role playing, etc. We put the camera into a world, whether it's one that we construct on the set or one that exists in this room, right? So we use the camera and sound to explore space, to explore character, and to explore the pieces. Now when you look around you at this space, you see pretty much a class and a screen, and a couple guys standing up in front of you. Now notice when I look around, in order for me to see what would be the equivalent of a film at close-up, can everybody do this? Mind. Don't drop your phones. Everybody do this now. Larry and Kyle say, do this. Finger to thumb, folks. Finger <laughs> to thumb. You either pass it or you don't. Finger to thumb. Now, what I want you to do, there you go. <laughs> Remember, we're sort of in CinemaScope. We have a wide aspect ratio, the frame size. That's right, we're not doing vertical pictures yet. We're here. <laughs> no, you're still, Sonia, turn one, you're go, go like this. No, go like this first. Thumbs up. And turn this hand like that. And then lift it over. Okay, you got the puzzle. Okay, now what I want you to do is to close one eye and put the camera <coughs> lens to the eye that you have open, not closed. <laughs> right? Okay, so I want you to keep it real close and do a wide shot fill up a lot of space and pan around a little bit. Now what I want you to do is to zoom in, move the camera away from your, your eye, and go to a close-up. Pan around, find a few close-ups and pieces. That's the key to filmmaking, pieces. No, I'm serious. Mm -hmm. You know, I, before I even use a smartphone, any kind of equipment, in my classes, my students have to do that callous thing. So fragmenting the situation or scene is critical. I look at the world through my full view of vision, the center of my vision, where I can see who that person is. But over here, I know there's brown hair, and I know there's a glob of folks over there. But that's also because of my history of having looked over there. But in order to see your expression, or your expression, I have to turn my head and look and put that detail in the center of my vision. And that's what you have to think about with the camera. The camera doesn't do what we do. 
The camera cannot see the world as we see it. I see the world as a camera sees it. So I see pieces. You took a photograph of the microphone. Yeah, in fact, I and uploaded it back. while you were introduced. Right. <laughs> and and so we see pieces, mm -hmm. pieces, pieces, hands, feet, faces, eyes. So encourage your own thinking to think of the world of film, documentary, documenting a reality, as something of a series of pieces that have to be put together to compress time and intensify story. So that's fragment. Movement, especially with these little uh, cameras, steadying the camera is extremely difficult. That's one of the real downsides, right? It's hard to do. I'll show you some things that you can you know, practice, uh, but ultimately that is a real issue. Um, well, there are two problems with the handheld um, and, and the smartphone camera. One is that the processor is working extremely hard to record the frames at the proper frame rate. So if you're moving very fast, it's going to have a lot of gaps. Because the camera isn't heavy enough to really hold steady, your breathing and your heartbeat will shake the camera. So if you use two cameras, a glove, a pillow, a hat, <laughs> to stabilize, that's great. Then you have to learn to move slowly and maybe redo shots. Um, if you ever use zoom, realize that on most smartphones it is a digital zoom, so zooming in will lead to a degradation of the image. But if, you, if students want to do that, they can do it. Why not? Who cares? Um, try not to pan laterally. I mean, uh, across items. So if you're panning, do something that tilts a little bit, too. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a very flat kind of move. Um, better, to, better to move than to, to pan. Also, there's a tendency to walk. I'm going to talk a little bit about this. When you walk, you walk, I mean, I walk like this, right? And everything's really, really smooth. But if you actually saw what my head was doing, it's going up and down and bouncing around, just like what happens when you pick your ca uh, video camera up and walk. You go, whoa, you know, we process differently. So if you are going to have students or yourselves ever use movement, let's say I wanted to move from you guys over to you guys. Most people would take the camera and go like this. Right? So I've studied Tai Chi because it was the way that I learned uh, how to move smoothly. And what I can do is if I know what the move is going to be, I don't even have to take a step. I can go from <laughs> you guys and just go right over here and land without even taking one step. And then the other thing you do if you do move, short, easy steps. Of course, I'm wearing cowboy boots, which are the world's worst. Uh, platforms for filming. Um, I prefer barefoot filming uh, because they have much more balance. Uh, but anything that you know is relatively flat and comfortable is way better than boots. I think that's your next time. What's barefoot that? filming. Bare, I, <laughs> when I did when I did a film with Alan Alda called The Human Spark, it was a series it was a series for um, PBS. Um, I I wore five finger by room green shoes for the whole shoot throughout the world and was stared at in many places. Use the tripod. Uh, Kyle has um, his camera on a mini camera. So if, you, if you're going to have your students have a conversation with an expert or a subject or something, invest in, you know, invest in one of these little things. I've got a can you pick up, I have two, even mine smaller than yours. I have a really tiny one too. Oh, shoot. Sorry. <laughs> and there's, and there's another yellow one. Oh, yeah, here want, we are. You guys want to just look this. at it and you can see. You need this an adapter back. to put the uh, tripod on, but use tripods. It stabilizes the image. And just to addendum to that, is I, I get pushback from students, and they're like, I can't afford a tripod. I'm like, get on Amazon. These are less than 20 12, bucks. So. 12 bucks, 15 so it's, bucks. it's totally worth it, too, because you're 
footage is just going to be better, you're going to do it quicker, and you have an easier time in post-production. Yeah. That's really true, yeah. I mean, it, 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 there are cost issues, as you saw in the spreadsheet that we sent out. Um, but most everything that we're talking about and that you're going to show mm -hmm. can be done with nothing but the camera and some kind of uh, software for uh, editing, either on a laptop or even in the, uh, the, the camera. Uh, stabilize. What to shoot. Always think about getting wide shots, stuff that are, that's full disclosure. Show the world. Establish the geography, the, the characters, the circumstance. Um, then think about fragmenting by going into tighter shots, pieces of the puzzle. So when I go into a location, I'm instantly looking for pieces, interesting portraits, faces, um, objects that I will be able to collect to be able to tell the story later. Um, Change angles on the scene or subject. Move around. So when I'm looking at you guys from here, it's very, very different perspective than when I'm over here or when I'm in the back of the room looking forward. One of the things I've noticed over and over again with um, our, our students is that when they first do their early assignments, try to put these pieces together, um, or even I do it a lot sometimes in the field because I'm in a hurry, I have the camera, a big camera on my shoulder, I shoot the wide shot, I zoom in, shoot close-up, 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 pan, tilt, and I'm done. Everything's from the same angle. Very hard to cut. Mm -hmm. Remember, cutting apples to apples is harder than cutting apples to oranges. Mm -hmm. It's really, really simple. If it's different and doesn't have continuity, right, you're leaning back, and then the next time I come over and see you, you're leaning forward, but I don't have something to cut away to, I, what am I going to do? It'll look, it'll look off if you follow strict continuity. Um, but Larry, you always want to come from the same side, right? Isn't there we'll talk about the 180 degree angle that's sort of coming up. Another that's a layer. Um, but what I, the, the, uh, advice I always give my students in, the, in tackling the exact same problem is I notice uh, beginners usually shoot from what is normal human head height and about three feet from the subject. All my beginners do that, and I start in the Tai Chi sense, say, you know, get down here, hold it up here, and move close, move far, walk around the room. Don't stay, like, shooting your subject, you know, three feet from them from your head height. Like, you be a mirror, be a verse, be a it's, you, it's harder to edit. Yeah, if everything is shot, pretty much the same image size from the same angle and head on, it's just going to have a lot of popping faces going on. But if I shoot low angle, and I shoot a high angle, and I shoot another low angle, and I shoot a high angle, I start building a pattern, right? It allows me to create variation. So it, um, change, that's what I say about changing angle. You know, sh there are two rules that we'll get to um, in, in the next slide, but um, reveals. A reveal basically is a move or some kind of action that reveals the situation. So what I could do is I could start my shot on the ground, on the carpet, and slowly lift up, be blinded by um, the projector, and then reveal the classroom. That's a reveal. Till down and find the, you know, the dog sleeping on the, on the road. Um, exits and entrances. There's a tendency that when you're photographing or filming that you want to keep everything contained in that prison of, of the frame, right? The frame is not where film happens. In fact, film happens outside the frame. Film hap the limitation of the frame is, of course, critically important. But more important is the implication of what's happening outside the frame, unseen. If I have a shot of Kylos looking at me, and you're looking screen right, uh, you're looking that's you know, left. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> so you're looking at me. I'm looking at you, right? When I'm on screen, you believe he's off screen over here. When he's on screen, I'm off screen over here. 
you're expanding the world through fragmentation. That's important. Important to know, important to communicate. Um, so, but let exits and entrances happen. You get up and you go to the door. I, my initial response is, hold on a second. You know, I try to race after you. You can't race reality. You can't chase it. You always lose. Unless you're really, really, really good. So if you get up and you're going somewhere, and let, let that person leave the frame. And then you can pick them up, compressing time, with an entrance down the hallway, uh, going out the front of Mary Great, or wherever it may be. So when you watch documentaries or films, be looking for these things to work your mind a little bit so that your students will be able to get a better appreciation of how the stuff's constructed. Pans and tells we talked about a little bit. Um, I, I don't allow zooming in my uh, first year class. Um, I, I allow motion, but the only way we change perspective, which means um, changing the ratios of objects, the distance of objects uh, to one another, is by moving through space, not zooming in or out. All that zooming does is magnify or demagnify an image. It, it doesn't move through space. So, um, and if you do find students zooming, uh, don't make it a naked zoom. Uh, you know, this is not about the body. This is about um, the zoom being naked. So instead of just zooming in, have some. You know, if you can have somebody walk by, or if I'm zooming in from here, if I go over a foreground object, that would be really important. And think in terms of three planes for every shot, foreground, midground, background. That's one. Uh, two, don't center characters. You know, the point and shoots that we have, and even with these cameras, everything always is, the focusing point usually is in the center frame. Um, I tell myself and my students that you, that I never look at the center of the frame. I look at the corners. That's a dynamic space to be. All right? That's where the world of film really happens. So I think about the rule of thirds. I think about a whole bunch of stuff. But I think about headroom for people. But I do not put, unless the style of the series that I'm working on demands a centered look, which I've done on a couple of uh, prison film and uh, a, a series called Most Evil for Discovery, we use that style uh, effectively for intent. Um, <coughs> so let's, let's go up. Sure. Okay, so what do we want to think about? You want to hold your shots, count at least to 10. I've been doing this since 1976, and to this day, I have to count when I find a good shot. Always. Cameras are not vacuum cleaners that suck up dust balls. <laughs> but Jason, you you know you're in one of my classes, and you know the, you you had to edit your early footage, and you didn't hold shots, and you had a lot of them. You go, oh that's a great shot. Oh that's a great shot. <laughs> it's never as long as you think it is when you see, watch it later. And you need length in order to compress time in your storytelling. Um, get the camera away from your head, which is what Kylos was talking about. You, the, the camera is a much freer recording device than our eyes are, <coughs> than our ears are. I'm stuck at 5'4", five, 5'5". Five, five. You know? But the camera, I can at least get up to somebody who's about 6'3". And the person who's 6'3 can really get a high angle shot compared to me, right? You can put the camera on the ground. Um, I also suggest that you think in terms of pattern building. You know, high angle, low angle. Um, look over your shoulder. I did a film about coyotes. And um, you know, coyotes are really cool animals. And every time I ever filmed a coyote, which included dozens of coyotes on our farm uh, up in the Minutes Valley of New York, before the coyote went over the hill, every single time, that I've ever seen a coyote leave, that coyote turned 
over his or her shoulder, look back just to check, and then head it out. And that's an important thing. You may have missed something by not looking the other direction. There may be something magical to film. So if you can share that with the students, that's also a great idea. Move around. The 180 degree rule, I'm gonna post a, um, a show me video of what, what the 180 degree rule is. But basically it says if you draw a line between two people, you have to kind of, for, for conventional filmmaking, mm -hmm. the camera has to be on one side of that line, that access line, that sight line, or on the other side. Because all of you are on this side, um, if you hold up your right hand and put your, point your thumb and forefinger out, right side up, um, and you're, these, this is the lens, this is the screen. This is the left side of the screen, and this is the right side of the screen on projection. This may be a little weird, but I use this all the time when I'm making films. I'll do a quick look. Oh yeah, they were looking that way. So if, um, if you use your thumb and forefinger, frame that shot on Kyle looking at me. What screen direction is he looking? Right. He's looking off screen right. How about me? Off screen left. Off screen left. Okay, uh, would one of you guys come up and break the axis? No, you can't break it. I meant you could stand or stand down. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or else they okay. be. So can somebody wall. come stand over here? Yeah. Are you? I just remember sitting in front of Right, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so okay. now shot on Kylos. Can you put your hand oh, on oh, screen? Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. What direction is he looking now? Um, you know, straight ahead. Yeah, what, 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 <laughs> what screen direction is this? Okay, so left. Right, he's yeah. looking screen. What screen direction is he, look, is he looking at? You from, from you guys. Right. 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 Okay, so let's say we have this shot of Kylos looking screen right. right. And looking this above. shot of me. Looking screen right. Oh, no, no. Oh. You both look. No, no, use your right hand, yeah. aim it at me. Yes. Uh -huh. okay. okay, so what screen direction am I looking at from this? From your point of view. From my point of view, you are looking left. So we're both looking left. We're not looking at each other anymore. Now we cut. <laughs> screen right. Uh, screen right. No. I didn't know that. So, so basically, instead of implying that we're looking at each other because of this axial break, we could cut to Elizabeth and we'd be looking at Elizabeth. Oh. Mm -hmm. You could add somebody in the room if you want to. Right. Yeah. So also think when you're editing triplets. Three shots makes a statement of sorts. Um, if I could one note on sure. that. Sure. If you get oh, shoot yeah. on both sides of this, of both of us talking, and then you edited a shot of Larry from this side and a shot of me from this side, we'd look like we were standing like this. Yeah. From the viewer's point of view, when you cut it together, we'd both be facing the same angle and it wouldn't look like we are talking to each other. One of us would be talking to the back of the other's head. Which we often do, but that's <laughs> not what we want to do. Even when we're facing each other. Um, so the 180, I'll put, I'll put a little show me up onto the handout so that you can play with that. The 30 degree rule says, you know, when you edit shots together, try to make sure that you've moved one shot to another at least 30 degrees so you're not cutting on axis, on line, right? It could be 45, 90, whatever. Um, another thing that I, I really think is important, um, how are you going to tell the story? How do you compress? You need to pre-visualize. Tell your students to think about the final product and what it might look like when they close their eyes. What do they see? So that they can collect, they can write a list of shots to get and go get them. Um, aesthetic intent and integrity is a little tough to cover right here. Um, get the best sound you can. Listen to the environment. Try to eliminate sound. You know, turn the refrigerator off. 
I remember to turn it back on. Mm -hmm. um, I spent a couple hundred dollars very early in my career restocking a refrigerator. And ever since that time, um, any time that I turn a freezer or a refrigerator off, I put my car keys put your car in keys that in. appliance. <laughs> Someone on set, put your car keys in this. Because yeah. that's the Always. only way you can guarantee it will be turned back on. <laughs> you can't leave. Um, uh, when you can't, and we'll go into more detail in the hands-on session, um, the <coughs> internal microphones that we have um, are acceptable. Uh, they're actually very good uh, if they're close, and you use it for narration, if you will. Um, if I'm filming you guys, and I'm asking you questions at this distance or tabletop interview, the internal micro, uh, microphones are not really good because they're too far away, they're not directional, right? So try to control what we call the ambient sound. Turn music off, turn fans off. So it's as clean as you can make it. If you feel the need to be able to, like, I, I have a Prius, so I, I love that car as a production car where I can do great interviews with people driving around. But the first time I did an interview, it was so quiet. Um, everybody who was watching the scene was distracted because there wasn't a sound of a car. So I had to add a motor. So think about wild sound and adding effects later, but eliminating them in your primary uh, track. OK, um, so we have different kinds of microphones, like a shotgun microphone that will be directional. Uh, we also have external microphones, like little clip-on lavaliers. Is there Jason? a device that has been created yet that uses, let's say, like you would have headphones and you would have a mic within that? That you could plug into your iPhone as almost like a. They're little USB. Pedal. There are USB um, like Skype headphones. Okay, and that well, you could clip that to your subject. And then yeah, but then they're going to be wearing headphones, and it's going to look kind of clunky. Well, I mean, I don't think that's the question. What's the question? You, yeah, like you would have into your mini or your eighth inch, you could plug an external or like oh, a yeah. wire. Oh like and a and a headphones, yeah. like a lav, a lav and headphones. No. Like Right now, the only way you can do that would be to go th uh, with a mixer. The biggest problem with these <coughs> cameras currently uh, is that you cannot monitor sound. It's all autom It's not always all automatic, but it's essentially automatic gain. And it's not bad at all, I, I have to tell you. Once, you. once you improve it with a decent mic, maybe not the best mic, but a decent mic, or there are adapters now where you can get an XLR. If you want to use a real pro mic into a mini, but you but know, there's still, still no gonna, audio. There's no it's still going to be a double system at that point. No, no, it's still going on to the camera. Oh, really? Yeah, but yeah, you're not the monitoring the sound. You're not monitoring the sound. Okay. Okay. It's stereo, true stereo. But there's limitations to it. Yeah, you know, that's what we're remember, talking about. But that's what you work within. So yeah, these are cameras that are in your pocket, and we're, we want to optimize their utility uh, in the classroom and outside. Of Okay, don't zoom for longer works. Um, a lot of people talk about A-roll and B-roll in the documentary. A-roll is the expert or, or conversation, the interview. I don't even like calling them interviews anymore. To me, they're conversations, a little equal footing in the, in the uh, connotation of that. Um, the, um, and then the B-roll is the stuff that covers the interview. I, I invert that. The, the, the stuff of good film, of good story, visual storytelling, is the scene of, of life, the scene that is unfolding or is being referred to. And therefore, think about the structure of that scene that has a beginning, middle, and an end, and the, <coughs> the, what's the A roll, the interview stuff, actually reflects on that, builds on that, rather than using. The, the, the so-called B-roll to illustrate, <coughs> as if it's in a slideshow, um, what is being said. And so that's a hard one to, to, to get down. But if you get coverage, you'll, if, with some intent, you'll be OK. Um, <coughs> what's next? Oh, yes, have, have you <laughs> <laughs> And no okay. matter what, this is from our, my prison series. <laughs> Uh, remember, don't let your tools imprison you. Uh, which leads us now to the tools that will imprison you. Um, but when I say that, it's 
everybody wants something better, but we have simple things. So um, could you play the Jackson? Um, the Jackson? Sure. I had just, uh, I gave this presentation out of the Jackson Hole Wildlife Film, Film Festival in September, lo those many years ago. And so I shot a little bit with my um, iPhone. Can we turn the lights? I don't recommend filming from the driver's side. <laughs> and I haven't shown this to my wife. But this yeah, is all. You don't? <laughs> <laughs> uh, not really. This is a slow motion shot. Sorry. This is a slow mo shot that um, I will talk about a little bit. But um, you can see it's moving a little slowly. It will shoot some mm -hmm. slow something. Mm -hmm. But that stuff's not bad. Is that the end of it? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is filmed on this. Um, and some of it had uh, some wide angle lenses or whatnot on it, um, but that doesn't matter. But it's remarkable if you are steady and simple, and even when it's bouncing, you might see some artifacts or whatever, but the image that's produced out of a lot of these um, uh, smartphone cameras are way better than you think, and part of it is the operator. Okay, so um, I'm going to try to turn on maybe just some of the lights uh, so you can see what we've got. But while I also, I can pull up things if you if there's anything we're mentioning, I can pull up the website yeah. for it. Okay. Um, we're going to go to the items, uh, to the collection. Mm -hmm. Oh, right, right, right. So is this now projected? Make sure it's awake. Well, even plugged in. Yeah, I'm plugged in here. There's no lights. Now we got lights. All right. Okay. I think it just happened. And if you have questions as we go through stuff, especially with these items. Um, so I'm going to bring the regular camera up and show you. Yeah, you have audio needs there, right? Huh? Audio? Uh, I don't need audio right now. Oh, all right. Well, I plug it in. OK, yeah, I, I can plug it in here. Hello? <laughs> so what we did on the spreadsheet was to create sort of pre-production, uh, video production, still photography, um, post-production, and then uh, some hardware stuff to get you thinking about the process of uh, filmmaking. There we are. Um, okay, that's that's my grandson, the artist, the artiste. Aww. He built a castle and then sat in this. So. Um, I just want to show you uh, what I did with some stills. Um, this is a still f from the Tetons, Jackson Hole. Um, that's kind of the raw image. Um, but I went into uh, iPhoto. And you know, you can be in any PC. Mac, I, it doesn't matter. I'm agnostic. It's just that I happen to have uh, you know, iPhones and I've got Apples. I've, I've never actually worked on a PC. Um, so I went into iPhoto. I increased sharpness. I increased contrast. I changed the colors. As you, it's a little hard to see, but in the skies, you can certainly see the difference. And then I started to desaturate. There's a little bit of color still in here. Um, and it changes the mood dramatically. And the last one um, is black and white. And that's just in, not even Photoshop. <coughs> it's just in, in, in iPhoto. I um, but these are really interesting things. You know on Instagram, you have uh, you know, filters and stuff like that. There are several 
pieces that we'll play with here to talk about that um, that are a little more sophisticated. A number of these apps we put up, for example, histomatic and retro camera, or antique or pixel pixelomatic. Uh, you can do basically more elaborate versions of effects or touch-ups than you do with like an Instagram or a sort of quick touch-up. Yeah, um, yeah, it's sort of like you're not you're, you can improve it rather than mush it. Mush right. It. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to go into um, the camera. This is the camera recording at 30 frames a second. There we go. Okay, and I'm not I'm not going to do a shot. You can keep seeing that it's looking, <laughs> and you can see it shake a little bit, right? Oh, you should yes. be able to see. And it's bouncing around. It's trying to try to try to find focus. It's trying to find exposure, right? And that's a problem. However, one of the first programs that I fell in love with was Filmic Pro. It's uh, listed up here. It's right here in production. Filmic Pro is my favorite. If you look at the screen you will see a whole bunch of things, but as I'm moving this around, this is focus, this is uh, exposure, and there's white balance down here. So I now am in auto mode, and it's gonna be just like the regular camera. It's gonna vary, and it's gonna pop, and it's gonna try to change exposure. However, this allows for manual overwrite, which is critically important. So when I find the focus point that I want to stay on for the shot, I lock it. When I find the exposure that I like, I can lock it. White balance is how colors are seen by the chip. It's not on, and I'm going to lock that in so it doesn't vary. And now, as I move across, there's a little bit of chatter. But the exposure is constant and nothing's mm -hmm. popping and doing anything. To me, that's the single most important attribute of any kind of software that controls uh, the, the, the frame. So um, the nice thing about Filmic Pro 2 is that it allows you to film at different frame rates. You can shoot at the standard 30 frames per second for what's common for video, or you can shoot at 24 frames a second and give it more of what we call the film look. Okay. Um, so that's something to, to think about. But there are a whole bunch of, I, don't, I can't go through steady, but you can do 48, even 60p to create slow motion. And you see up here, you have a lot of capability. Mm -hmm. They're really, really fun. Just um, a quick time check, it's 11. Okay, so let's finish this up quick. So I'm going to keep this lens on, uh, this on, and Kyle, maybe on your side of the room with your phone, mm -hmm. you can show um, what happens when you start adding wide-angle lenses. Oh. And if somebody has uh, a in? five, oh, no, just, no, just um, show. Does anybody have an iPhone five? You want to slide it in there? Um. Be careful that it can slide out. Uh, you want to turn it the other way? You want to put, yeah, you want to put your phone. Right. Got it. Sorry. Okay. <coughs> turn it on. No, you turn it on and turn it sideways. Go to movie. And you'll see what we did. So, Kyle has. has a, yeah. uh, I have a device here called MCAM Light, which the body is essentially the same thing as, uh, what, what is that called? Smart Focus. Smart Focus. Um, it has a wide angle on it. If anyone has a four, or 4S that they want to try out on it. Okay. The body is different. The way the bodies are slightly different yeah. and where the lens is is a little different. But yeah. what I want you guys to look at is your field of view. Um, these are called iPro um, lenses. I have a little, a smaller mount that's on my camera all the time as a protective case. Um, but it allows me to do a little bayonet. where I'm going to keep my center, let's make this the center frame, and look at the, the, the scope of the wide angle uh, now your, your compared camera. to what the camera comes with. Take a look. 
I can't put it on instantly, but that's a wide, that's the wide angle. Now I also have what's not what I really like about the about this system is that it's modular, and inside the handle that you can use for filming, you have a variety of lenses. Uh, this is a telephoto lens, so it's a two x extender. It's really easy to see. So now I go much more. Now I have to change my focus. If anyone else has a four and would like to try out this wide. Um, so if I could, are you are you yeah. at a good positive spot? spot? Okay. Um, so one of the things I would like to mention uh, here. Go ahead. You need this on the phone. Uh, and I shot this as Larry was introducing himself on this mic using the macro lens that comes with that. And you can see the focus. You know, that might be a little in the background there, not sure. Um, but it's, it adds a lot of rea or like real camera filmmaking to the device. Now, <clears throat> before sounding too much like I'm trying to sell it to you guys, um, I'd like to bring it back to uh, a PDF Larry went through of all these approaches to filmmaking and how to shoot a scene and all that. I want to make a, a metaphor for you guys. If you're going to bring into your classroom, either videos that you've made for lecture purposes or an assignment that tells students to take advantage of what their smartphone can do. Basically, all this that we've been talking about, that's their grammar. If you want an essay or a paper, you want them to write with good English, right? You want them to know how to write a paragraph, a sentence structure, and you know, carry their themes through and all that. We're trying to tell you that if students just run out with their camera, the product might be watchable, but a better product has some good grammar and has some intelligent decisions as far as how you execute that theme, that story, and that structure. So we're giving you that building block. Now when you add to that an app that gives you some control over the phone and perhaps a device that gives you some control over lens, it's only going to elevate it to a better place. And if you yourself are going to shoot your own lecture, which I do, I teach an online there. I teach an online Photoshop course in the summer, and this was shot with that exact device and this um, phone, where I really don't want to listen to myself, but uh, I was in San Francisco teaching in a program there, and I had students here that I was shooting instructional videos for, handing off the footage to my TA. So I would introduce my videos using the phone and intercut with the screen capture of the Photoshop demonstration. So you can do your own lectures. This isn't just students can make things for you or come up with an assignment. There's a second side to what we're getting at too, is you can record your lecture. You can do it in a more deliberate, better grammar way with these devices that give you a lot of control and variety. And you know, there's a lot of ways to apply it to your classrooms or your classes, whether it's for strictly online teaching it can also be for a flipped classroom situation where you put the lectures up there, they do that at home, and you come in for discussion and projects rather than having to do the lecture face to face. And I've been experimenting with the flipped classroom myself lately, and I found it very, very useful to get students moving forward faster because they're working in front of me. They watch and listen to me at home. And hopefully, they're disciplined enough to do that. But, you know, we take what we can get sometimes. Um, so that's the macro. I just saw, uh, I, the first time I got this and shot my first macro shot, I was like, oh my god, this really works. <laughs> it does. It's yeah, it's just like, I showed it around to my students. I shot a macro of a flower, and I was like, guys, check this out. And literally every student, what? You know, so that's when it really, like, got home. Um, just check out this audio for a second so that you can hear. I, this is my little portable filmmaking rig where I have a shotgun microphone. Um, and so I, I don't know if we can control the volume on this. There should be a volume there. Oh, it might be not. Sure. Yeah. 
little plug-in microphone that would help you know help improve the sound right but stay close to your subjects with this kind of um, setup or I got this from the new media center over in the library um, this is a clip-on microphone just use it use it to, it's a wired clip-on microphone uh, Put it right about the sternum, that's where it's designed to be placed, not up here, because if somebody turns, they go off mic very easily. Hey, uh, let me get this here. Just put it right here and plug it in. And this is the, this is the best thing to use, essentially, for conversation, interview. Right? Even, narrate, <coughs> even if the students are going to narrate, put it here. <coughs> So there's a, a and, and these are not terribly well. This microphone that I use is about a two hundred dollar microphone, but you can get microphones for is that twenty bucks. Is that mine huh? or not? Is that mine? No, that's not yours. It's okay, I know. <laughs> no, I have the same one here with me. That's why I asked. Uh, but it's also the one I have, which is pretty much the one you just showed, is right here. It's thirty dollars, and it, it actually improves. You know. Oh, there you go. Yeah. That's it. And then I, I actually, I actually, I actually, um, 3D printed that from from that image. <laughs> You're kidding. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, this is uh, uh, students who work outdoors, and it's always nice to film outdoors. Don't realize that sound is almost impossible to get outdoors because they think that this, um, this um, you know, styrofoamy cover uh, is a windscreen. It's not. It really is just a protector for the microphone and it's a, what's called a pop filter. It helps keep the energy from hard consonances from overloading the audio. So what you really need is a furry. It's called a softy, a dead cat. <laughs> oh. uh, and that's, that's what Someone's it's called in the trade. It's a dead, where's the dead cat? Um, and it just fits over you have to get it for the microphone that you're using, but it will help in windy conditions. For this microphone, this was like 40 bucks. So, but it means that I can actually record sound outside, so it's worth way more than $40 to me. So um, think about um, these, these little items. Um, do you want to show your student? We've got, yeah, we've got a couple, uh, If uh, just one mentioning, and these things are on the handout to you guys. We're showing you these rigs that are, to us, these are small, right? Mm -hmm. But I also know that, you know, someone who's coming from the other end of not a lot of experience making video, you might be like, oh, that's actually good or something. Everything that I'm presenting fits into this, mm -hmm. which can go into this or into my shoulder bag or into my backpack, and this is with me all the time, um, all the time. And if you if you poke around a little bit, I often start with Photo Jojo, but there's just it's a great any story. searches. There are other options that are even more compact. Just to mention yeah. that there's a variety of lenses that magnetize right to the body of your phone and give you. Come on, let's get, get give you the other internet. Um, so this just goes directly onto the phone. Uh, I just bought my father a few of these for Christmas, actually. Um, <coughs> And uh, there's other, you know, this is a Gorilla Pod that holds the phone, so you don't even need an adapter to screw into. And so it's just poking around, you know, putting together a decent little set somewhere between fifty and hundred dollars. These go up to, you know, these start at one eighty, so things jump up pretty quick. But comparatively, it's not a, when you think about how much textbooks cost. Mm -hmm. This is an investment in making good projects of some sort. You look like you. I don't know whether you're waving at me. Or no, I have a question. Out. What's your question? <laughs> so um, a mistake that I've made in the past is I was responsible for interviewing the subject, mm -hmm. and so really had to have kind of a mind focused on content. And what happened is that all of the capture that I was sort of naively trying to do was <coughs> low quality, and that, sure. you know it was useful for the. Content 
content and the research purposes, but not useful for the visual purposes. Mm -hmm. So can you give me some practical advice about how you, if it's just me, myself, and I, okay. and I'm interviewing colleagues, okay. what do I do kind of when I walk in the room to get something that when I walk out of the room is going to work? Well, first of all, I would have to, I'm just curious if you can, uh, can you tell us what you thought didn't work? Was it the lighting? Was it the sound? Was it the shot, the angle? It was everything. everything. All right, that's fine. That's totally, like we can work with that. I just wanted to see. I felt right, like so I needed another person to well, do that, that professional help. job. Mm -hmm. Actually, I don't have that okay, so you, you need to avoid high contrast <coughs> foreground, background, and lighting. So if I put you against that white wall, it's really not going to work very well because of the dark shirt that you're wearing. So I want to have something usually that's more neutral in the background so I don't overexpose or underexpose. That's again why I like I this mean, Filmic Pro. Oh, that's terrible. Right? Um, um, so, so that's one. Two, in terms of lighting, a reflector or a small light that bounces or brings light to the eyes. Um, top light is a real problem in most interview conditions because we're, we have top lights in offices and with you know, like my more Neanderthal you know pronounced forehead I get raccoon eyes really easily so we need to even take a, um, a, sh a sheet of paper and bounce some light into the into the screen Kylo said listed a flex film and you can, you can tape it paper tape it clip it but to that's it. not quite my question okay mm -hmm. my okay. question is more um, do I take a bunch of shots at the beginning and then set up the camera and sit down and have a conversation? And then in okay. that case... I'll send you a draft uh, chapter on the art of interview. Great. Okay? Yeah. And it will be even more complex than you think. Okay. However, um, there are two philosophies of thought in terms of the content. Okay. Uh, some uh, directors like to shoot the scenes, the life, uh, first and then based on what they get, have a conversation through the interview because they know what you shot and you can talk to them, right? Personally, um, I like that. Others will do the interview first and then say, okay, you know, he talked really, really well about this, you talked really, really well about that. I gotta go shoot some of that in the lab or at the computer, I gotta get stock footage of what you're talking about and do, do the B-roll, if you will, after. The reason I like doing the A roll first is because I want to gain trust of the person that I am filming. And the best way to do it is to prove to that person that I'm not dangerous and let them live their lives and I film. So you're in your office, you go, you do stuff, and then I sit down, we're more comfortable with one another. They understand that it's not a news piece and it's the conversation may go on for a while. And we talk. And where's the camera when you're doing that? When I have the camera, when I'm going to interview Kyle, first of all, I never like to have a desk in between me and the person being interviewed because it's a very defensive position for that person. It creates a superior, you know, a barrier, which is not very good. So Kyle's going to sit here. I'm going to put the camera as close to my eye as I can get it without him looking into camera. Conventionally, okay. conventionally, there's the implication of a correspondent, mm -hmm. right? So, I'm so you're looking at off. Him, not at the camera. I am filming everything, pretty much everything that I do, unless I'm told otherwise, with people looking directly into camera. I think it's more honest, and I think it works better for, the, for most web stuff. But you don't want them bouncing back and forth. So you have to be a director. Say, don't look at this, look at this. I'm here. Don't worry about it. This isn't going to jump up and bite you because that flicker back and forth is crazy. And <laughs> you have an obligation to your subject to present that subject as well as you can or want to. I mean, no, there have been times where I've put on a fisheye because I didn't like the person. Um, and it really worked. My editorializing was good. So I like, I like the camera to be either slightly above eye level or slightly below, but not on. If um, Kyle is going to be looking at me and I'm talking to him, he will be framed
He will yeah. be framed. <coughs> You're looking at me. Okay. Yep. So he is going to be le uh, right of center, right? And if you rotate all the way around, so your right shoulder, uh, your left shoulder is more towards me, coming into the frame, back. <coughs> okay. So if you, this is not bad, I have him to to the right of center, but I'm not cutting off his shoulder, right? I'm not cutting off his head, but I'm not putting him in the middle. This is what you guys do, yeah. <laughs> right? This is what we do. Yep. Suddenly, there's rules of thirds, right? It's a little bright behind him, so we might, you know, say slide over this way. I try to separate the person from the background so you're not up against the wall. You can fill in the rest of that phrase. Um, and I'm going to be probably here, maybe here. A lot of times the height has to do with the um, lighting and the structure of the face. Like I would prefer anybody who's filming me now not to film me from a low angle so I can avoid my double dewlap here, right, that comes with age. I want to be a little high, you know, good cheeks, high, you know. So we're a little off that, and I'm going to be right here, mm -hmm. and you're going to be looking at me, not over here. Mm -hmm. Look over here for a sec. This happens a lot with our students. It's as if there's a correspondent over here, but what's missing is the shot of the correspondent. Little right. Topo Gigi. Right. right. So come closer to me because I don't have that more room. I usually shoot a medium shot, uh, maybe a little bit wider for the easy first questions. Say, so what's your name? What do you do? Um, tell me the tell me why you like what you do. Mm -hmm. But as soon as I get some basics, and I shoot wide so that I know that I'll have a lower third or an ID under him or her. If it's in a foreign language, I always stay looser so that I can have the subtitles not plastered over the person's mouth. I've made that mistake plenty of times over their forehead. Um, but then I'll, can I zoom in? Yeah, I can zoom on this, but I can't remember how. Um, uh, move closer to me, closer still, okay. So, and again, this, and now this feels awkward, right? It looks awkward to you guys, it feels awkward to you. But I'm gonna tell you, this is okay. Mm -hmm. you, this image works. So while it seems strange, it's working great. Mm -hmm. Let's just have our conversation over, you know, at the bar, you know, mm -hmm. and that's what it's gonna be. And so I like being in closer, right? <coughs> I like the close-up so I can see the expression of the face. If a person is very um, active with his or her hands, I'm more likely to use a low sh and a wide shot so I see the expression. Um, I did a film about um, uh, the Hubble spacecraft. It was called Mysteries of Deep Space. And uh, a cosmologist, we filmed at uh, Johns Hopkins. And he was um, Italian, and he was just using his hands every, and he really was, he was fantastic. We started the, the interview with him sitting at his desk, but he wanted to start showing what's on, you know, the Hubble images on the wall, so we scrapped it, we started all over, and just lit the whole room, and I went handheld off the tripod, and we just danced around his room for an hour, an hour and a half, and it was great, because, you know, the, 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 what you want to instill in your students when they're talking to someone are not the facts, you know, journalistically, sure, who, what, where, why, when, how. There's a, my main question is why. So what, what, what do you do? What do I do? Yeah. I teach in the Washington semester program. I teach global economics and business. <laughs> what got you there? Why do you do that? When I read the, I can't even read the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> that seems so strict. Why, why do you do that? Well, it, you could go back to where I was born in Havre, Montana, and I asked my grandfather that question once. How did you become a rancher in Montana? And he said, a man is like a piece of wood that gets washed down the river and washed up on the shore someplace. He stays there for a while and then finally washed, gets washed out to sea. And you, so tell me more about that childhood of yours. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, no, seriously, that's what I would do. I, I might have a list of that questions. Yeah, like 
I might have, you know, and if it's a person who has a certain personality as you do, I can throw that to you and you'll accept it. Other people will, you know, go up. So you have to read people. You have to, yeah. Then yeah. Can you talk a little bit about editing and how to add uh, music and so on? The yeah, that'll take another session. But um, <laughs> I'll tell you, I, I think the best thing to do is uh, take advantage of the free tutorials that we have on Linda mm -hmm. and use iMovie. iMovie is a very simple stepping stone. It's free on new computers and inexpensive on older ones. Um, it is simply cutting and pasting. iMovie. And, yeah. yeah, iMovie. And then you can lay, you have transitions. They even have cheesy music you can right. use from there yeah. now. And um, we have access through a, if you're an AU professor or student, you have access to Linda.com, which is the premier video instruction. Can you add some of this on, on to Blackboard? Sure, yeah, we can make that. Uh, sure, yeah, 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 sure. Yeah. Yeah. Plus the interview uh, manual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the um, interview thing also in the 180 right. degree. Uh, uh, the, the, we have another yeah. question now, over this, here. Is this a special, uh, special software? Yes, that's yes. On, on here. Oh, that's I up there. That's, that's on this, this, this document here. Great. Right. So we can add all this together? Is it's it? there. Yeah. This and is already up there. All right. And what, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm hoping is that you'll pick your cameras up and before are we have to go now. Well, we're getting close, but I think there's a couple more questions. Yeah, questions. And if we wanted to pull up any of the other videos, yeah. we may be we a little short on practical okay. stuff. Okay. But, you know. Um, hold on. We uh, this this lady and this woman, this oh. nice young lady, has been waiting quite a while. Yes. So. No, no. I just had a few suggestions procedurally about. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Okay. Oh, I was just going to say, since you your strength is on um, developing the content uh -huh. of it, and this is a new component, and focusing on the content, know that holds, and then when you go in, focus on being the filmmaker. Okay. so that you don't have to worry about doing both at the same time. Okay. And maybe limit your parameters where they come to one room that you've already set up, you've prepped, you know the seating, you know the lighting, and mm -hmm. just sit each person down. That way, you can practice, as you're practicing getting <coughs> your technique, you don't have to be as sort of overwhelmed by all of that. Thanks. Um, to, follow, to follow up on a very good suggestion, practice first. Don't make mm -hmm. this shoot the first time you try it. Do you have friends, family, students? <laughs> then get to that content, the equivalent content that you're looking for, with them, film them, test and, your uh, gear. What I've often done in interviews, like Larry said, is to, he was like, I'm going to direct Kyle, like, let them know you're going to ask them to say things again. Be like, I'm going to take some notes and I'm going to ask you to repeat yourself. I want you to be prepared for that. Because what I've always done is I've found like, here's three or four things that they touched on that I really liked, I'm going to definitely use. And I always explain, like, I loved when you talked about the story about your grandfather. And I would like to hear that again. If you don't mind, maybe we can make a little more concise, a little less ums. But let me put the camera up over here this time. Okay. And I'm going to ask you to tell me a couple of those stories again. And that gives you a whole other angle. And as long as you're talking in that very positive, like, I loved that thing. But, you know, I think we could be just, just for me, it would be so much easier if it was just a little bit more compact. You can switch your angle, and it's going to give you more variety. Okay. <coughs> well, thank you. And, you know, just look. Look at the frame and see beyond the content and look at the composition. Record a little bit of the person stating his name. I usually ask people what they had for breakfast or dinner or, you know, how they sleep last night, just to get audio levels and get them going. And then I play it back just to make sure my gear is actually working. So you plug your earphone in and you listen to the audio to make sure the audio is working and make sure the image looks okay. Because on playback, you'll see it as film, not as real life, not as reality. You had a question? Lighting. Lighting. Especially at nights. Ah. What will be if you're on the streets in the dark? It's tough. Um, <laughs> a, tr a, a, ga a gaffer, tr a a gaffer a truck. A big truck. Um, I use, um, first of all, I try, again, with these, with these cameras, <laughs> and, and I figure if NSA knows, I don't care who. Actually, I'm now really happy about the one looking at that. That's <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, I have 
a little th six by six uh, LED light that runs on batteries. I can show you one of those. And it just adds a little bit of um, eye light to the person's face, but you're never going to be able to light the scene. There's a variety of them, but this is a long line. So, so the, the cameras can handle low light pretty well, but it's going to be grainy. It's going to be noisy, yeah. which is what it is. Um, okay. um, one bit of advice I give my, my VisLit students, if they're shooting with a smartphone, they're shooting at night, and it's like a street scene, is that people are much more forgiving is if something is lit. Find a street light. Find something that a is window, lit. Yeah. yeah, or a window. Yeah, great to put your subject by so there is highlight. As long as there's highlight to see, we're forgiving of the dark shadows that are involved in the graininess. But when everything is dark, there's no highlight. It's just washed out, and That's right. the whole scene is dark. Your phone's struggling. You can't do much, and the audience won't be as forgiving because we don't see anything. Yeah, you but need you some, some light some somewhere. Detail, even in the silhouette. Or, yeah, or even semi silhouette. silhouhette. silhouhette. Your audience will be for me. Use yeah. light that's there. Two questions over here. One How do you two. find the built-in uh, light for the iPhone or video? Um, what you do is you scroll up and hit yeah. flashlight. Oh. No, how, how does it work for you? Does it work pretty well? Um, oh, it's an eye light. It's an eye light. Like. <laughs> here. Um, <laughs> I know how to find it and how to get it. I just wonder if it works pretty well because that's built-in light. Right. right. Here, here you go. Amber it's true. as well as uh, light. Here you go. Um, can be a little harsh if you're near too yeah. close. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So it's on now. Ooh. And yeah. Am I up there? Oh, I'm not up there yet. Too much. No, it's not too much. There's no light yet. The light's not on. It's not on. Uh, how do we do that? Oh, that's actually. By the way, I was given that advice. I forgot. You have a partner who has a, no, cell, a cell phone. Oh, you get them to go to the side on to the side. Yeah, you can just turn it on. Yeah. So here, I just turned it on. Yeah. So that you have a light to the side rather than that harsh straight on. Take your glasses off for a second. Sure. Okay, so this is this is with it on. This is with it off. So it pops a little bit, you know, it pops it nicely. And it really, yeah, I, the key for me is to see, it's like the revolutionary where I see the whites of their eyes. Sparkle, sparkle in an eye gets you to peer into a scene. If there's a shadow, the, the, see this is an eye light that's going right to the light. I could, I could cut that down and take a piece of, um, for, you know, tissue paper or something and diffuse it if I wanted to. But yeah, coming from the side would be even better. Um, but if you're shooting where there is um, contrast, a highlight and a shadow, shoot into the shadow. Shoot the shadow side, not what's called the key side. Looking into the shadow gives you more, the shadow gives you more modeling more three-dimensionality, more character. So we don't try to eliminate shadow. We try to control it. But I, I, I'll post another show me thing that's, that I call the interviewer sandwich if there are external lights. Mm -hmm. You have the light, the interviewer, the camera, and the subject. So the subject is looking into shadow at the and by the way, I mean, if you're going to endeavor into this either for your own professional work or you're asking students to do a video project that, you know, you've set up parameters of what they're supposed to cover, whether it's a history project or a, you know, law project or a bio or whatever, science, um, the internet's your friend and so is the app store. In fact, I found a manual for beginning filmmaking as an app while doing research for today that I'll add to that document. Um, and if you just find these things and post them in 10 minutes, you'll have like 20 things that students can look at or you can look at, you know. And it's sort of interviewing techniques. Plug yeah. it in and see what comes back, you know. And it's um, sort of flipping the classroom. It's sort of saying, okay, there's resources. Here are resources. You figure it out. Now go and experiment, test. Mm -hmm. So that it really is, to your point, much better to practice for real and revise. 
and then that helps you get much more comfortable with the tools of, the, of a trade that we're very, very happy with, you know? Yeah. How much time should I allot for a small project with the, so it's a, maybe I want to get two minutes out? The problem is that, the, that two minutes may, will take as long as a half an hour film yeah. because it's harder to revise down, down, down. So, because I'm not in journalism and I don't go from a 30 second piece to a longer two minute piece, which would be easier, um, you have to distill. Um, I would assume that you would need at least a half an hour conversation with your subject. You would need at least another hour of, of filming life and other stuff. other stuff, collecting. And then post production is a week. An hour film for broadcast with a editor and sometimes an assistant editor working uh, six to seven days a week with a lot of overtime will churn out an hour film in six weeks if it's well scripted. Twelve weeks is better. Okay. Um, so a two minute piece without ha having done it before will probably take I'm going to guess 40 hours. Okay. Mm. The, 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 I guess I should put well, on. I mean, I it could go we, fast. It we can go a little faster. With our film students, we ask for two minute pieces. They probably have about two weeks to do it sometimes. I mean, granted, we're yeah, that's true. at a certain level. But, but they're also doing Linda, and they're also, right. you know. Um, if you need help, look, uh, for <laughs> all of you, um, you need more advice, you need help, get in touch. Yeah. We, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm we kind of, we accidentally skipped you. I, I really enjoyed the, the timeless nature of what you're telling us about this, about how to do this right, that kind of seems kind of technology independent. Sure. It's agnostic. Um, at the same time, I'm totally fascinated by, by the gadgets and the fact that this stuff is moving along so quickly. I know that there's something this afternoon about Google Glass, but I wanted to ask you as filmmakers, where do you see us in 5, 10, 20 years um, in terms of what our capabilities will be? to do this kind of stuff? Ten years, I, my hunch would be that it'll be contact lens glass. We'll be, we'll be able to wear a contact lens that'll self-document. Yeah, I think so too. Um, I, on, the, on the subject of Google Glass, I think that that's like the equivalent of a PDA. Like PDA showed up and were really like huge for six months. But then once phones started to integrate that technology and we captured a real smartphone, they were just a stepping stone to the thing that really worked. I think Google Glass is a stepping stone to whatever's next, whether it's contact lenses or a microchip in a brain, or I don't know. But <laughs> maybe maybe we'll have like these little halo, uh, <laughs> halo quad, you know, quad uh, drones that just constantly stay two feet above your head always, and everybody has one. Uh, it's sort of like in those medieval paintings. Uh -huh. I mean, if, if we can um, look at the technology we see now and take science fiction as a step up, because if you go to like these things, Dick Tracy's watch, Star Trek, it's all predicting stuff in one way, shape, or form. I think that what we're seeing in pop culture that people will want is things projected with light. Like, we already have the light keyboard. You can get a Bluetooth style and you type on the table. It, it works. And I think the next thing is somehow light projected whether you see it and control it with your hands, mm. or it's actually there and you see it and control it with your hands. And because we're yeah. you know, working on things that do this in a very cumbersome way, mm. but there's just a period of time until they figure out. I think the whole thing, too, is that it's about democratizing through miniaturization, mm -hmm. the ability to communicate and break the barriers and the power structure of uh, networks, cable casters, and uh, distributors. Um, what did you have to say? say in reverse, right? Yeah. So if anybody wants to come over and play, um, you know, email me, drop me a note, and you can we can go over specifically, you know, I, I, what's your name? Ann. Ann. You know, specifically, what location you're filming in, what are the problems here? Oh, think about doing this, this, this. Come, come over and play. I, I have this stuff. Alice is around. Yeah. Um, and if you have any questions for us in general, I think uh, 
We had one last comment. I just had a question. Um, I think Dan brought up a good point. Memory issues. What? How do you handle if you wanted to use your eye, your phone uh, for a well, half an hour, an hour? The, there's a, there's battery power and memory. Yeah. Um, because of the, uh, you can think about getting a Mophie juice. So you can, you know, um, plug a charger in to keep running. Not some are not terribly expensive. Um, being on uh, airplane silence saves your battery as well as processing power. Actually, so you get more run. The other thing about that is it cuts back on static and the audio. The audio, right? So you're turning into airplane mode, so it's not getting the regular signals of the. Now, now also, network. also, um, I, I get rid of all my music. But you don't add an extra chip to save. Yeah, the right system. now you you can get. Um, adapters where you can put SD cards in okay. and on some programs you can offload to there. You can't record to it, so you can offload it, but not all programs. It's, so I'm yeah. careful and it's limited. For but sure. we've always been limited. Yeah. You know, we can only shoot 12 minutes of film when we shot film. We can only shoot as long as the tape is that you bought. So I've been doing tests for a web series I'm about to shoot using this and I can get about half an hour give or take. That's not so bad. I shoot for half an hour. I tell everybody to take a break. We're going to offload it and we'll move ahead soon, you know. It's just the dynamics of it. Yes, sir. Excellent. Now okay. I have a second job. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you.